Hello. Welcome. It is another edition of Twiloha at Home. It's a special edition as we are in the middle of our Worth Living For World Suicide Prevention Day campaign leading up to September 10th, which is that big day, World Suicide Prevention Day. And that whole week here in the United States is National Suicide Prevention Week. Uh, we're doing two of these Twiloha at Home Instagram Lives this afternoon. Uh, I know it may not be afternoon where you're watching. I always think it's cool if you want to share where in the world you are, what time of day it is, how you're doing. Uh, we love seeing those comments. We love hearing from you. My first guest today is Andy Slavitt. Andy has an incredible resume, an incredible background. Um, he has a podcast called In the Bubble with Andy Slavitt. We're going to talk about that. We're obviously going to talk about mental health, suicide prevention, talk about Andy's work, his his career, and his take on this moment, this year, as it relates to mental health and preventing suicide. Uh, before I get to him, I'm gonna I'm gonna pin a comment. Lindsay is in Florida, e-learning, remote working, all the challenging buzzwords. Let's see. I'm gonna pin this comment. You would never know how hard it is to pin a comment. Okay. All right. The comment is pinned. Uh, so as I said, we're in the middle of our biggest campaign of the year. It's based on the words on my shirt, worth living for. Every year, we build a campaign around a statement or an idea that has resonated with us. And ultimately, it's inviting people to think about why life is worth living. And so this year, we're inviting people to wrestle with these words, what makes life worth living? What is worth living for? What are your reasons to stay alive? And how can we invite people into that conversation? We have set a goal of raising $250,000. And that money specifically will go to helping people get the professional help that they need and deserve. Um, it's going to help provide counseling scholarships, 3,500 individual counseling sessions, and more than 45,000 searches using the find help tool on our website twaloha.com and very briefly an introduction you can come to our site click on find help enter your zip your zip code uh, navigate some filters and pretty much instantly for you or a loved one you can find a list of local mental health resources and that's something we're incredibly proud of we love being able to share that and so part of this money that we're raising will go to make that more and more accessible for, for more people across the United States. And I want to mention the Twiloha team is here as well. So it's not just me. I'm obviously on the Twiloha account, but our team is here commenting. And so you may see them uh, with the orange icon as well, the orange logo. Technically, it's a white logo on an orange background, but they may answer some questions and um, we're glad to have them. Let's see, if you have a question for Andy or later today for Joel or Kayla, please use the question mark box at the bottom of your screen. So we love seeing your comments, but specifically if you have a question, that's the place to do it. Look for the question mark icon. Let's see, worth living for is the place, worthlivingfor.com is the place to go to learn about this campaign. How can you get involved? Can you become a fundraiser? Can you donate? How do you get this shirt that I'm wearing? How long does it last? What's the goal? What's it all about? Worthlivingfor.com. And you can see that in the comment that is pinned at the bottom of the screen. Screen. Screen is different. Uh, let's see. You can buy a pack. You can become a fundraiser. You can join our community uh, texting program where we will send you updates related to this campaign. We have new podcast episodes. We obviously are going live on Instagram, Facebook as well. We're doing another one of these. Uh, at 4 Eastern here on Instagram Live with Joel Leon and Kayla Stokline and excited about that. And then Thursday, we will have another Facebook roundtable conversation at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is with Nzinga Harrison from the In Recovery podcast, Heather Monroe of Newport Academy, 
Michelle Giordano from The Trevor Project, and this week's topic is understanding suicide. Every week, there's a different theme, a different topic to focus on. This week, it's understanding suicide. A great place to start the conversation would be to read through the comments on yesterday's Instagram post, where we simply asked, what do you wish people understood about suicide? We got some great comments. We'd love for you to check those out. Let's see, in the middle of free worldwide shipping on orders of $25 or more. Ends at midnight Eastern tonight. So again, free shipping anywhere in the world if you spend $25. So if you have not ordered your pack, it's a great time to do that. Uh, Please send your video submissions. Every year we make a video and we invite you to be a part of it. And so please send your video submissions today and you can email those to WSPD, World Suicide Prevention Day, WSPD at Twiloha.com. You can learn more about the video submissions at WorthLivingFor.com. Let's see what else. Fundraising. I mentioned $250,000 by September 13th. 100% of these funds will help us sponsor counseling sessions and run our Find Help tool. We are currently right around $65,000 raised, so we're doing great, but we got a ways to go. And for the past 24 hours, our friends at Newport Academy have been matching every donation up to $10,000. So we still have some money left in that matching grant. It's a great time to donate. It's a great time to become a fundraiser. Again, worthlivingfor.com, and you can learn more. And with that, I'm gonna bring on Andy Slavitt, Andy, are you here? I know you're coming from the Lemonada. I see it. I'm going to add Andy. Our team mentioned it, but we are excited to have Andy as a guest. He and I have not met. We spoke super briefly. Hey. Hey. Can you hear me all right? I can. You hear me okay? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for joining us. You got it. It's so great to be here. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Absolutely. I have to ask, did we, we had a quick call earlier and, and did you have to bail to get ready for Dr. Fauci? <laughs> yeah, I had a quick TV spot. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me do that. No way. I feel cool with being a part of your day that included Dr. Fauci. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, hey, for, for those of you or for, for the people watching that don't know you that haven't followed your work. I wonder if you could just give a, a brief introduction, maybe a little bit about your career. And um, I know it's incredibly impressive. I know you worked in the, the Obama administration and wonder if you could just share what life has looked like for some time now. Yeah, well, it's great to be talking to everybody. And uh, you know, as you point out, life has lots of twists and turns. And I think that's one of the exciting messages I think you guys are putting forward, which is you never know the good things around the corner. I was um, you know, kind of uh, living uh, here in Minnesota, um, from Chicago, married, have two boys. When uh, healthcare.gov, uh, which you all remember that, crashed, uh, it, le- it all felt like everything was coming apart at the seams. Um, and then I became the, um, the chief firefighter uh, that went to Washington and helped to turn it around and get it stood back up. And at the end of that, the president I asked if I would stay and serve out the remainder of his term, and I did as the uh, person running Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Since that time, I've done a number of things. I started a nonprofit of my own called United States of Care, which focuses on getting um, uh, adequate health care to everybody in the country so we don't have to worry about that one more thing. Uh, It's a journey, but we're getting there. Um, I invest in uh, low-income and underserved marginal communities in health care. Um, and then I, uh, I have a podcast also, like everybody else in the United States. If you don't have a podcast, you might want to consider that. Um, I was one of the last people to have one. It's called uh, In the Bubble, uh, and it's about life during uh, the pandemic in all sorts of all sorts of ways. So um, excited to be here. Well, thank you. And I, it's easy to joke that everyone has a podcast, but not everyone has the guests that your podcast has had. Um, I was looking through and you've just had some incredible folks that have shown up for those conversations. And when, when did you start that? So our first episode was April 1st and it was actually funny because my, my 18 year old came to me, he was home 
doing school from home. He was a high school senior. He's kind of a quiet kid, uh, doesn't talk much. And he said, hey, Dad, uh, you should do a podcast. And I said, would you do it with me? And he said, okay. Now, if he would have said, Dad, let's carry mulch out into the yard, um, I would have, you know, this is the number of times my son has asked me to do something. It's a clear reflection of the limited options he had. Um, yes. But we, did, we decided to start a podcast. The theme of it really is, we talk about it as 50% Winston Churchill, 50% Fred Rogers. So can we be helpers? Mm. Uh, and can we help people speak with a, a unified, calm voice and understand that we're all in this together? And um, we've kept that up. We want it to be something that the whole family can, can listen to. Uh, and then we bring in guests, as you've said, from uh, people who are, um, I mean, we think people want to hear the truth, but they don't need to hear it in kind of dramatic tones, but they want to know what they can count on. So we brought in every, everybody you'd expect from scientific community, but also um, senators and governors who are wrestling with, should they pass legislation and how are they thinking about it? And um, how they should be carrying out their plans. And then even entertainers, we had uh, Mike Birbigley on this week. We had Tina Fey on. And then we do something called toolkit episodes, which is to say, what are the tools people need to get through the pandemic? Mm -hmm. So we, we had one very interesting one on how do you talk to people who disagree with you about masks and social distancing? Wow, yeah. It's actually the opposite of what you think, right? Um, we had an episode on what you need to know about vaccines. We did, we've had a deep dive into how does the CDC function? How does the FDA function? So. Um, it's great to be able to, to, I'm just privileged to be able to communicate to people the things that I think will help them um, get through times. Wait, so how is your son involved? So he's been the co-host. Okay. Um, and and, uh, and he, he, his name is Zach. And he did this thing called Zach's Facts. And every show he would give you a new fact that he would research because he's sort of that kind of, kind of guy. Um, but uh, as of last week, he decided that um, it was time for him to go become 18 again. Okay. As he was starting college. So um, we had this tribute episode to Zach because Zach was far more popular than I was. Um, <laughs> Zach would, Zach, if you've if you ever listened to see, he, he um, like, I would say, Zach, meet, I'd like you to meet Chelsea Clinton. Say hi to Chelsea Clinton. And he would say, yo. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, mm, uh, can you try that again? And he'd go, hey, what's up? And yeah. I'd say, okay, um, maybe a full sentence. And he'd go, uh, Mrs. Clinton, I really appreciate your work. But, and so everyone thought he was putting that on, right? You were and, but he was shy, he's, a, he's a shy kid. Yeah. And uh, over time, he blossomed. And he really, um, you know, he, he would ask really good questions. And he had it in him. And it was so much fun to watch him come out, to watch it come out. And people who listen to the podcast got attached to him. Mm. Um, we, and I'm, I imagine you would agree, we've seen that there's obviously a mental health component to this pandemic. It affects quite simply people's basic needs. Um, it, it affects really every aspect of, of life around the world and certainly here in the US. And I wonder, kind of through the lens of mental health, maybe even related to the podcast, what are you seeing and, and hearing from people? So, in, 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 so first of all, we have mental health crisis before the pandemic, sure. right? So we're, we're underserving people um, in so many ways, as you, as you well know. And, uh, and we do this because of what I think of as the triple stigma. We institutionalize stigma, um, we have private stigma, and we self-stigmatize. Mm -hmm. um, worst of all, we take the signals for people that, because we already don't think we're okay. And so we, we take signals where people communicate what reinforces that feeling, and um, and so we need to do we need we need to do better at that for a long time. And I think we've been getting a little bit better. Um, but then you think about this crisis, and I think about okay, there's obviously a health dimension to it. There's obviously a um, financial element to it for any people. Um, there's a giant uncertain element to it. And what do we normally do in times of crisis, like during World War II? Um, when people were sacrificing and throughout ages, we had each other. Mm. We had physical warmth. We could put our arms around our family members and our friends. Um, and those sources of comfort um, are who we are as humans. Yeah. So, um, and we know 
that uh, being alone and being isolated gives you the false sense that you're the only one going through a challenge. Gives you sure. the false sense that you are alone. When we have just a, a lot of people that are uh, they're actually together alone or alone together. I don't know which way to say it. But, 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 um, and so um, it really concerns all of us um, because, um, and so, you know, on a podcast, I say things like, um, freaking tell people you love them. Just, mm. just tell, like, tell me you've never told you love them before, right? Like, they'll, they'll fall over. Maybe you'll feel goofy, um, but maybe you won't. Maybe you'll feel like, wow, I'm really glad I did that. Yeah. Um, and maybe there's a bunch of people you haven't called in a long, some people you haven't called in a long, long time that you haven't connected with. And, you know, now you're sitting home and you can kind of sit home and wallow or you can, you can kind of call someone and say, hey, thought I'd want to hear from me. I've talked to people. I'm not one of those people who keeps in touch very well. But I talked to people that I hadn't talked to since high school. And I had a like, two-hour conversation with, with this woman um, and I found out that um, 25 years ago, her brother died. And I found out a whole bunch of things about her. She caught me up on her life. Uh, and um, I told her that I missed talking to her. And she, she'd been watching my podcast and seeing me on TV and so forth. And so when, when I called her, she was surprised to hear from me. Um, but like we made each other's day. Yeah. Um, and so um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm I know I'm answering the wrong question because you asked me about the challenges of mental health, but, and, and instead I'm talking about the opportunities in this time. But man, uh, there's two things we're going to remember about this time period, as far as I can tell. One of them is how many people did we lose? And by lose, it's not just to, to COVID, it's how many people did we lose um, that we didn't need to lose. And the second is what did we do as humans? Like we're going to remember what did we do to help? I know that there's a feeling we all have, which is um, self-protective, protect your family, protect yourself, um, worry about yourself, deal with your uncertainty and all of that. And it's ironic and odd that oftentimes the best way to do that is by stop worrying about yourself a little bit, going out and helping other people, people who you think are hurting more than you are. And I think that's an extraordinary opportunity in this pandemic that I, I, I don't wanna miss personally. No, that's so good. Thank you for sharing that. So throughout your career, you've worked to expand access to healthcare. And we know, and this is sort of foundational to the work we do, that mental health so often feels somewhat left out, right? It seems like the asterisk. We're comfortable talking about physical ailments. We talk about cancer and heart disease. Um, but we, as a society, haven't always talked about mental health and haven't known if we could. And I wonder if you found that true and maybe why, and, and do you think that relates to the stigma that you were touching on? Oh, a hundred percent. So I, I do this thing with my own brain where when someone says uh, mental health or, or addiction, I substitute the word diabetes or cancer and ask myself if this, if it makes sense. So, you know what, we, we decided it, he was uh, not going to let, we were not going to let him in for more treatment because he refused to take his insulin. What? Yeah. Are you, but that would, no one would ever say that. Sure. But, you know, we've decided that um, um, I'm not going to ask for who the best specialist is because I don't want my neighbor to know that I have rheumatoid arthritis. Never happened. Never yeah. happened. You'd say, hey, they have rheumatoid arthritis. I have rheumatoid arthritis. I wonder if they went to someone good. Um, and and I I found that, you know, when people say things like, uh, look, I'm a believer in harm reduction, and I'm a believer in um, uh, none of this is anybody's fault. Fault is not part of the conversation. Um, it, these are these are diseases, these are chronic conditions, uh, and they're treatable. Like that's I think number one message is they're treatable, but they're not treatable unless you understand it as a disease. It's mm. if you think of it as something's wrong with me, I can't be fixed. Uh, then, then you're then you're limiting the possibilities. But if you understand, hey, I've got something that's that's like high blood sugar. It's like a bad cell. It's whatever it is, doesn't matter. But I can treat it. Sure. And there's professionals that can help me treat it. There are medications that can help me treat it. And the longer I go, the more I'm torturing myself. The more I'm putting myself in a state where 
I am believing that there's something deeper and deeper wrong when that's not in fact the case. You're just suffering. Yeah. I want to remind you folks that are watching, if, uh, if you have a question for Andy, we would love to get to one or two of those. You can submit. There's a little question mark icon at the bottom. Obviously, we love seeing your comments as well, but we're going to find questions there. This is a question that came from Lindsay Kolsch on our team. She's one of our co-executive directors and a fan of yours. And she said, you've written about how not addressing mental health care will continue to see the country's life expectancy decline from issues such as substance abuse disorder and suicide. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we've we've undergone. Um, thank you for the question. It's it's um, you know we're the only developed country that has had a step a setback in life expectancy, and uh, life expectancy is very much related to um, uh, to to trauma and to our experience with trauma and how much we've dealt with trauma. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't do this. I really feel quite badly, but it's just two seconds. No, no, it's okay. Um, okay. Um, the, uh, and, and so um, if you go through trauma, and by the way, like no one keeps score, right? You're like, you don't have to go to war and say, well, gee, my trauma wasn't that bad. Um, your brain doesn't know the comparative difference. Sure. If your parents got divorced, and that was traumatic for you. That's trauma. And if you don't deal with that trauma, and it comes back and, 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 and hurts you, um, there are other options. Um, so let's understand that, um, th and there's healthy ways to deal with these things. There's less healthy ways to deal with these things. Uh, and th the good, great news is there's evidence on what works uh, yeah. if you get to the right uh, people and you put in the work and it's kind of scary uh, to face. But um, if you, we're a country that has a lot of trauma in a lot of communities and we have a lower, um, and, and it's hurting our life expectancy is the question applied and it's happening everywhere. And it's taking different forms. It's taking forms of suicide. It's taking forms of addiction. Um, and, and so those things have to be dealt with. I, I would say one other thing, and I don't know whether or not you, if you want to push me back on this, because it's not an appropriate topic, but I also worry about, about guns. Um, I worry a lot about guns um, because people go through um, phases, like we all do. Like every, you know, every, every, you know, we all go through lows. Sure. We all go through highs. Um, even the most stable among us. And so to um, Im be able to impulsively act on that low because of the presence of a firearm for a teenager, for an adult, uh, for anybody, um, that, that's a real concern. And, and I, I, I'm not saying that we don't have to address the, the root cause mental health issues. Of course, everything I said would lead you to understand that I believe that. But, um, but then we have um, these um, tools we don't need, and guns are are almost entirely um, u are used in suicide. I mean, th suicide is the number one um, reason that not for cause of death in firearms. And I think it's just um, it's something we have to um, come to grips with and understand. Yeah. Do you feel like, and first off, I'm, I'm with you, and, and I think our team is with you and grateful that you would bring that up. Um, it's obviously such a polarizing, divisive topic and conversation. Do you feel hopeful that, that people are understanding and, and maybe open to that part of the conversation? I feel hopeful about everything um, because there's, there's, I, I mean, uh, and I don't mean that to uh, be flip, but but I feel like anything we can talk about, we can make progress at. Anything we're committed to, um, we can make some progress at. Um, and uh, is it a straight line? Not necessarily. Uh, we all know that. There will there be setbacks? Absolutely. But then like one day you break through. I mean, look at topics like um, marriage equality. 
I mean, if you'd have told me when I was growing up, you'd have told me a year or two before the issue was, was finally dealt with by the Supreme Court that that would happen. I think most of us would have been surprised. But cultural attitudes changed. Cultural yeah. attitudes changed towards smoking. Cultural attitudes have changed towards a lot of things. And they don't change automatically. I mean, it, it may look like it if you're far away. But it's work of people like you, to be, to be totally honest, and all the people on this call that make those things change, that help people understand. And God forbid someone should have to go through losing a loved one to suicide, uh, to an overdose, before they understand. Um, enough people uh, have had to do that, that it, and, 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 and are so graciously willing to share their experience, so painfully and graciously willing to, um, to share their experiences so that other people don't have to. Hmm. Um, so if, if it's cool with you, we'll get to a, a question or two from the folks watching, is that okay? Of course, of course. Well, here's a good one. So how does mental health show up? How has it shown up in conversations or in the bubble? Um, yes. So it, it shows up in everything. I mean, to be, to be honest with you, um, I don't think about, I try not to think about mental health any, any more than I would say physical health. Health is health. Um, and, and I try to talk, if you listen in the bubble, I don't always do a great job of it, but I try to talk to people and, un, and try to ex understand and express where I think, what I think people are feeling and, and ask the questions. I do a lot of communication on Twitter. So I have a pipeline to a lot of people. Um, and the, uh, the thing that I find um, is that um, if you make it like a whole separate thing, mental, you know, it's, let's wrap a big box around it and unwrap it and now and tie, take off the ribbon. And now we're going to talk about mental health. Um, you know, it, it makes it easier to stick. It, it, it's harder to reduce the stigma that way. Um, and like one of the sad things um, is that, well, there's some good news that says most Americans now um, believe that we shouldn't have stigma towards mental health. Okay, that's good news. Here's the bad news. 80% of Americans say that they would not be comfortable having a close relationship with someone with an addiction problem. This is not mental health, it's a, but, but an addiction problem. So I look at that and I say, that's a problem. That's a problem. So, um, you know, I, I had, I had Chris Hayes on my show and I said, how, how, how is it feeling reporting this kind of news? And he said, I'm depressed. And we talked about therapy and we talked about that. I had Kamel Nanjani on the show, you know, whose, whose wife is sick and he made this movie about her called The Big Sick. And I said, I, I just said, are you scared? And he answered the question and he said, as if no one had ever asked him that. And he was so glad to be asked. They just went on. He said, Andy, I'm super scared. I had a just, I, I just had a panic attack, and um, I, I feel out of control, and I've never felt like this before, and I don't know what this means. And um, you know, he talked about it um, on the podcast, and I think I, I'm so grateful that people are willing. Michelle Obama just said that she has low grade depression from all of the things going on right now, and I'm so grateful because that's an example. That's not. That's not people lecturing about mental health. That's, yeah. a, that's people using their own example in ways that I think make a progress. So it, it seems like it's important to frame it or reframe it in, in human terms, right? These, these are human issues. This is part of being alive on this planet, right? That when we stop thinking of it as such, some separate thing, maybe there's power in that and it, it disarms it some. Um, yes, absolutely. Kind of leads to uh, a, a segue. Um, you seem in your work big on personal stories, big on the value and the power of even individual stories. And I think it might be easy to imagine that if someone is in your shoes, you know, leading this conversation with you're talking to Dr. Fauci on television, like it, it must just be 
brilliant people and it's kind of this whole different world but it seems like you come back to the value of telling stories and, and using stories as examples and that's something we touch on and I wondered if, um, if you could kind of comment on that yeah. and certainly when it comes to mental health we we're constantly inviting people to believe that they're not alone and that there's power in in sharing their story and in vulnerability so you know when they put me in charge of, of CMS um, you are you are you are responsible for delivering the care to 130 million people right so you're like okay well what's the most important thing i could do so the first thing i did every day is i read emails sent to me um by individual beneficiaries like and so a medicare medicaid beneficiary right who takes the time to write me um and then um, it is usually some, uh, they're very upset about something. It's a long email and it's, uh, and I, um, and then I would, I would email or call them. Um, and they would just be shocked. And I did that as, as an example for the staff. Um, because, and then I, I had a conversation with the staff there and I said, look, problems will come to our door every day. It's a trillion dollar budget. It's the biggest agency in the world. It's the biggest, we're seeing the biggest healthcare system in the world, but I want you to just know two things. I want you to understand my definition of the difference between a real problem and a fake problem. And I'm like, well, what's that? That sounds kind of interesting. I said, yeah, um, a fake problem is a senator's mad at me. I still expect you to handle that professionally. I still expect us to handle it professionally. Yeah. But if someone's mad at me, but you know, if senator's mad at me because something, he didn't get something he wanted in his district, a real problem is we've got kids in Flint, Michigan, drinking um, poisonous water. That's a real problem. And I would like to see you get your, I would like to see your upset level um, uh, accordingly to the, to, the, to the level, because no one's going to yell at me about the Flint, Michigan problem. You're going to have to figure out, and you're going to have to yell at me, because the kids in Flint, Michigan, and their parents, they don't have a voice in this arena so um it's it's stories it's stories it's, it's stories is absolutely a great way to communicate but for me it's more than that too it's also making sure someone reminds me and beats me over the head around the impact of my work and the privilege that i have to impact people's lives and if i don't do anything with that if that I'm wasting, I'm wasting time. I'm wasting, I'm wasting myself. I'm wasting opportunities for others. And I find it's necessary if you're a public servant to take it personally. Every time something bad happens to take it personally. Yeah. And, um, and if someone says, you know, gee, Andy, uh, it wasn't your fault that this, this Indian reservation didn't get a healthcare open on time, um, it's not helpful to me to, for it to be okay. Certain things just can't be okay when you're a public servant. You just have to fight nonstop and you have to decide what criticism you're willing to take and which criticism you're not. Someone's always gonna be mad at you. Sure. Um, it's a question of what, we, what, what, what you think is the right thing and can you, and can you do those things? So I, I, I try really hard to make sure I'm connecting into people's stories. I'll tell you but just one more thing. The most amazing thing that I think I've ever done on Twitter is the simplest thing. I, I said, send me, if you don't mind, attach the one picture, the one photograph from the last six months that best represents the pandemic to you and with, with one sentence. And uh, we, there were like 10,000 pictures sent and attached they were beautiful. I mean, a little girl with a, uh, you know, 20 feet away from her grandma, they were both doing a hug, um, you know, uh, all, all kinds of, all kinds of things that just told amazing stories. And, um, and it got millions and millions of people ended up looking at it and, um, and had emotional reactions and added, and ended their own picture, added their own pictures. But if I wanted to, if you say, hey, what was this pandemic thing like? And you said, can you send me an article? I say, no, just go look at that. Let's go look at those pictures. Yeah, that's so good. So um, 
I know you got a lot going on, so we won't keep you much longer. Um, I feel like something I run into is, you know, people, mental health. Um, I sometimes use the example when I have an event or we have a suicide prevention campaign, no one shows up to protest. It's not all that divisive. Um, but, I, but we also run into people who say, hey, I, I support your work with mental health, but I don't do politics. Um, I'm apolitical or I, I just don't like it or I don't understand it. And I wonder how would you invite someone to begin yeah. not to think about that intersection, but to participate um, in believing that they can have a say, certainly a vote, but, but just po participating in the process of um, increasing access to mental health care for people. Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll, I love this question. I think all your questions have been great. Um, there, we're, we're probably about underinvested in this country in mental health by about $75 billion. If you believe the premise we talked about, which is that mental health is like every other illness, and you were to compare um, how much we invested in HIV AIDS and how much we've invested in other things, we could easily spend $75 billion to invest in the infrastructure and the personnel um, and the, 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 the training and the education and it'd be a, it'd be a wonderful use of money, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, so how does that happen? How do you go to Congress and say, spend seventy five billion dollars on us? And the truth is, um, while you're right that mental health, both sides agree it's a problem, and both sides would address it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, nobody makes the compelling case, and to make a compelling case, you need millions of people in you know green t-shirts or purple t-shirts, whatever color t-shirts you want to pick orange t-shirts that are coming to the Capitol every day. And when I, I had this conversation with Patrick Kennedy about, and I said, look, there are 18 million people in this country who live in families that have lost someone to addiction, to suicide, to the streets, to mental illness, to institutionalization. I said, there's 18 million people that have a hole in their family. Hmm. And that to me, like hashtag there's a hole in my family um are, are people who you know, can you turn the, the political question is can you turn people into single issue voters around your topic which is what happened with things we've made a lot of progress around marriage equality etc so if you want to turn someone into single issue voter try having 18 million people um, who are on behalf of the person they lost want to make it better for everybody else um yeah singularly saying, and you have to have something you want, right? I mean, it's not, gear, gearing people up for a goal is much easier than gearing people up to support awareness, right? Or a topic. So, yeah, so say, look, I want, we wanna get $75 billion out of Washington for the following things, you know, mental health, mental health in schools, you know, a 10 point program, this is what we would use the money for. And we want every family in America that's been affected by this to advocate for this and advocate for the part of it that if it had been there, you might have your loved one home. And that's, that's, um, that's, that's the real work that in our country it takes to overcome the forces of politics like money, et cetera, that are, um, that are in the way. Yeah, I got two questions left. I think they'll be a little bit quicker. Um, for people looking for specifics, you know, they, they wanna learn more, what are the, what are the policies, um, what, how can they research this? Are there websites or databases that you would, um, that you might recommend for someone trying to learn and participate? Yeah, I think, um, I think, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the organization, but um, uh, I don't know if you know, do you know Ben Miller? Um, he's from um, um, Wellbeing Trust, that's what it's called, Wellbeing Trust. Okay. They wrote, they wrote the paper on um, diseases of despair and deaths of despair uh, that was uh, that everyone I think many have seen, which sh show all the people that have died uh, from alcohol, um, drug addiction, and suicide, and how that will we're unscheduled to lose two million people over the next decade. And he's got a series of sort of policy prescriptions proposals, both local, state, federal. Um, and he's the, poly, he's the policy director there. You, you, if you don't know him, you, 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 you two would probably very much like each other and have a lot of comment. Um, so uh, I'd say that's a great organization. Um, 
who do do things at the policy side. Patrick Patrick's organization does as well, um, and uh, and it's worth paying attention to uh, to 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 them because he is you know he has good access on the hill. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Thank you. So last one, we're in the middle of our World Suicide Prevention Day campaign, and it's based on these three words worth living for. And we're inviting each guest to to just kind of share maybe some of their list, what makes life worth living. And, and so I wonder if you could complete the statement for us, I'm, I'm living for. Yeah. Um, so the truth is that the um, best moments in life are interacting with people you care about and doing something special together. Um, and I think the first thing I'd say is that those moments are ahead for all, for all of us who put in um, the effort, even if they feel so far away. Um, so there's there's just always hope of that. But you know, I'm 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 living for I don't know if it, if it's if it's for for personal connections. I'm living for purpose. Um, uh, I'm 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 living to um, in some in some respects to make the next generation better to succeed at the things that I failed at. Um, I'm more I'm more acutely aware every day of the things that I haven't succeeded at. So I don't want to. It doesn't mean I'm giving up. People. Oh man, that's that's so good. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being with us. It's it's great to meet you, and. Uh, yeah, we know you got a lot going on. So thank you for the work that you've done for for a long while now. Thanks for all you're doing. This was really great. I, uh, it was nice to talk to everybody. Absolutely. Thanks, Andy. Have a good day. Okay. So we're gonna let him go. Uh, just want to remind you guys we're gonna we're gonna do this again at 4 p.m. Eastern. We're gonna have two more guests. Um, so we're going to take a little break. And just to remind you, we're in the middle of our Worth Living For campaign for w World Suicide Prevention Day, which is September 10th. That whole week here in the U.S. is National Suicide Prevention Week. Uh, we are working toward raising $250,000, and that money is going to go to removing the financial barrier that exists for people that need mental health care. So it's going to translate to 3,500 individual counseling sessions, 45,000 searches using the Find Help tool on our site. We would love for you to learn more about the campaign, worthlivingfor.com. Our website is the acronym. It's T-W-L-O-H-A.com. We would love for you to donate. We'd love for you to become a fundraiser. We'd love for you to order a pack, which is, includes... The t-shirt I have on, we're in the middle of free worldwide shipping on orders over $25. That's until midnight Eastern tonight. So there's a whole bunch of good stuff happening. Uh, we'll be back 4 p.m. Eastern with Kayla Stokeline and Joel Leon. And then we'll be back uh, Thursday for another Inst uh, sorry Facebook roundtable, also 4 p.m. Eastern. Nazinga Harrison from the In Recovery podcast, Heather Monroe of Newport Academy. They have provided us with a $10,000 matching grant that we're finishing up right now. Michelle Giordano from The Trevor Project. And this week, Thursday's topic is understanding suicide. So again, worthlivingfor.com, and we hope to see you at 4 p.m. Uh, thank you again to Andy Slavitt. It was an honor to speak to him. Just such a such a cool guy, such an impressive guy that has done such important work for a long time. And we were uh, really honored to get some of his time today. So thank you guys again, and hopefully we'll see you in a little while. Take care.